Eric Skaugen, who's also the VP and GM of different companies. <laughs> Martin's with HP, and Kirk is with uh, Intel, specifically the Intel Data Center Group. So we're going to talk a little bit about VCS, what you guys are doing. You got some interesting developments going on. How you doing? Good, good to see you. Hi, Dave Vellante. Kirk, Hi, Kirk. pleasure. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Martin, good to see you. So uh, welcome. HP Discover, big show. You guys excited? It's only day two, day one and a half, so yeah. we're no, still actually, going it's strong, been, right? It's, it's been a great show. It's a huge environment. It's great to see the energy um, and everybody just going through and seeing all the technology that's out there um, across all of HP. So it's actually been just a tremendous show. Yeah, so um, so give us an update, Martin. What's going on with, uh, with BCS? Uh, we had a guest on earlier. We yeah. were talking about... All kinds of things that are going on in the in the HPUX side, but uh, yeah. what are you guys talking about these days? Well, so from a BCS perspective, um, it, it, what we like to talk about is the fact that last year we did a complete uh, architectural re-innovation of the entire mission critical product line and what we call the mission critical converged infrastructure, and uh, and it was just incredibly well received by the marketplace. Um, they love the new Superdome form factor. They love our new bladed form factor. And, uh, and basically the response to that was we want more, right? And so what we announced here at the show is a number of new innovations to allow customers to scale uh, their Superdome platform uh, even further than they could before to 32 sockets or 128 cores. Uh, as I'm sure Car Kirk would love to tell you, as we get hmm. to uh, the next generation Itanium processors, we'll actually take that up to 256 cores. So just tremendous there. Um, customers actually, one of the things they love about HP, uh, the in integrity platform overall, is our virtualization technologies. Um, everything from electrically isolated hard partitions, virtual partitions, and HP virtual machines. And so they wanted more again, and they said, we want all of that technology across the product line. And so we delivered on that as well by extending our, our virtual partitions merging that with our virtual machines and making that available across the product line. And so uh, so customers are just excited about that. So, you, so Kirk, these guys, you guys have a, 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 an aligned face to the world. What's, um, what's Intel's take on all this? Well, I think we're excited. Uh, just last week, we celebrated the 10th anniversary, the anniversary of Itanium. Uh, so on May 29th, congratulations. Marked the, <laughs> yeah, so we're now. Uh, Still a baby. Yeah, I didn't yeah. have a cake either. So. <laughs> But, uh, I guess in this industry, ten years is a long time. But uh. yeah, but we've grown uh, we've grown the product line now to a four billion dollar a year hardware market, which makes it the second largest Unix shipping platform in the world, over Spark now at three billion. So that was a huge milestone for is us. Spark too. dead? I just, uh, you don't have to answer that. It's okay. <laughs> Steve Mills answered that for you. He said oh, he unequivocally did. dead, yeah. Okay. So, go ahead. Sorry. No, but we're, we're excited. Um, $4 billion hardware market, 14,000 applications now on the, on the architecture. So um, our commitment from Intel is basically every two years to double the performance of Itanium. So we did it last year with something we called Tequila. Uh, we're showing here at the conference really the first working Pulson demonstration of an 8-core that will double the performance again next year and is on track for... for so uh, double the performance every 24 months, which is about... Moore's Law? A, yeah. A, a you know, on the Xeon side, we've done it every year, but in this mission critical space, customers take a lot longer to qual a, a stock exchange or, um, you know, an, a, an ATM infrastructure. So we've gone, and, and at the customer's request, we've decided to do bigger jumps, but do them every other year, whereas on the Xeon line, we'll do it uh, once a so year. So that's the balancing act, Martin, that you have to manage in right. your business. You've got the functionality, which is the reason why people right. stick with the platform, and then you've got the pressure to maintain you know, within reason, the price performance curve, right? How do you manage that? It's, it's a really tough balance, and I've, I've actually had numerous uh, humorous conversations with customers um, where they'll start the conversation with, uh, please don't change anything, my environment runs, and then they'll finish the sentence and, can I have all the cool new latest things, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and I tell them, do you realize what you just asked me, right? And they, say, they start to chuckle and say, yeah, I know. Um, but you're right, that's the tough balance is we're dealing with a customer set here who on the one side needs to make sure they, they do manage that leading edge of technology, but they can't disrupt their environment um, at all, right? So downtime is measured in zeros. That's, that's really where they want downtime to be. And so, uh, so that's the, 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 the tough act that, that we have to work with Intel and manage. And so we, we come up with the best we can trade-offs. 
Yeah, so I, I don't know if you knew this. I used to run a bunch of businesses at IDC, and I was there, and um, nobody wanted the mainframe business. And I said, I'll take it because you know, <laughs> it was declining and downsizing. It was getting killed. Because, But the reason that I was interested in it is because I figured those are all the smartest customers, the most demanding customers, and everything that they're doing today, they're going to want to do on open systems. Right. Now, you guys at the time were quote unquote open systems, right? And now you've it's taken 10 years and now you've sort of hardened those systems. They're very mainframe like today, isn't it? Well, um, we like to believe that uh, we deliver that mainframe class performance, resiliency, and, uh, and but at a much, much more cost effective price point, right? So from a total cost of ownership perspective, allow customers to move off of mainframes and get all of the benefits of a uh, the resiliency of a mainframe, but at a price point of open systems, absolutely. So, what do you? How do you deal, Martin, with the whole ISV thing? Right. I mean, you know, ISVs are, are all about optimizing their their revenues, and they play games with licensing. Oh, we're going to do it by cores, or you know, whatever <laughs> it is. Oh, virtual systems, great. We'll take advantage of that, and they're very good at that sort of increasing their, or at least maintaining their their net contract value, and it puts a lot of pressure on you as the the yeah. service supplier and the ways in which you license uh, your operating system and so forth. Can you talk about that a little bit? What you're seeing in the market, how you're working with customers, and what you're advising them? In some ways, I actually view that as an industry challenge um, because you're right. We have some vendors who tend to license by a user. Uh, Microsoft, a good example of that. Um, others license by socket, others by core. Um, and it is a real challenge for customers uh, because they have to work with all of these different licensing models that the software vendors are providing. Um, and uh, so the, we, we have a number of tools on the software side, both with HPUX as well as our HP software portfolio, in order to help customers manage their licensing and their license obligations. Um, because part of the challenge that customers have beyond just the cost of it is compliance and, being in, and, and manage the compliance that they have in the rules and regulations, the reg regulatory bodies, uh, and make sure that they, they remain in compliance. So there's no sort of one easy cookie cutter answer uh, because different ISVs have chosen to apply different business models and how they, they, they deliver their software. Others do it through subscriptions, through usage, and you know the, it's an area where vendors have chosen to innovate in their business models and you don't really want to stop that innovation, but at the same time it is a real customer challenge to say, how do I leverage that innovation, maintain compliance, um, and understand what my licensing obligations and costs are? Yeah, so it's a tricky balancing act. So I wonder yeah. if we could um, switch gears a little bit, talk about the strategy and vision, Martin, from your perspective, and then Kirk, how, how Intel sees that and fits into and aligns with that. Sure. So bumper sticker it for us. How would you describe, in your words, the, the, the vision and strategy of your organization? Yeah. And so what we've done is we kind of have to raise the strategy up one level to across our enterprise storage servers networking. And so the top level vision and strategy is what we call the converged infrastructure and basically bringing together server storage networking through to a common modular architecture. Then when you bring it down to the BCS level, we say, well, our job is to take that converged infrastructure and deliver not just a converged infrastructure, but what we call the mission critical converged infrastructure. So we essentially combine all of the servers, the storage, the networking, with the special secret sauce of firmware, operating system, um, and things like that in order to deliver a true mission critical environment. And Itanium uh, from Intel is a big part of delivering on that vision. Yeah, for us, I think uh, I can sum it up in one word, and that's choice. A at the end of the day, we think choice drives competition, and when Intel entered uh, delivering server chips back in the late 80s, the average price of a server was $58,000. Today, it's less than $3,800. And you know, um, you know, what we're trying to do is deliver the most mission-critical choice out there. So whether you're an HPUX, OpenVMS, and nonstop customer uh, on Itanium, uh, HP is obviously our largest customer, but customers do have choice. They have Bull, Hitachi, NEC, Inspur, Huawei, and others they can choose Itanium uh, hardware from, uh, and that gives customers uh, confidence. On, on the Xeon side, if you're Windows um, or Linux, you know, HP is scaling up the ProLiant line I as well, um, and that just delivers choice, uh, and that's great for customers. So that was $58,000, you said, in, in the 1980s. When did, when did Intel enter the 
Michael well, we got a, a 486DX2 with the original a, compact, and then a Pentium Pro launched in 1995. So, you know, we've really looked at, on the Xeon side, we're, we're really excited about HP's converged infrastructure vision because Xeon has turned from a server processor to a server storage and networking processor. Right. So uh, we'll now be in about 80% of the world's storage, uh, a large part of 3PAR, for example, uh, et cetera, at HP, and now we're moving into switching and routing as well. So the the fundamentals that drove Compaq and HP over the last couple of decades to drive that cost out of servers, we see extending into storage and then into networking. Good. You know, what amazes me today, which is why we're so excited about what we're doing on Itanium, is still 2% of the world's servers that are on power and Spark and on mainframe make up $15 billion IT spend. You know, so Intel and AMD have about 97% share of x86, but that remaining 2% is still $15 billion of spend. Our job is to basically deliver the best performance, best reliability, but at dramatically lower costs with companies like HP. Yeah, that's a pretty astounding metric. It's at 58,000 down to 3,500, I think, was the average price. Yeah. What do you think would happen to oil companies if their price of their product <laughs> yeah. dropped that much? We, we live in an amazing industry, gentlemen. Yeah. It's uh, good. So, uh, how about cloud? I mean, where does you know? That's the big buzzword, right? Um, you get you both get a thousand points for not mentioning cloud in the first <laughs> fifteen <laughs> minutes of the interview. But where does it fit? Um, right. So, uh, it, it, so basically, a, we have done the work to make sure that uh, customers who have built their infrastructure on HPUX can leverage all of the capabilities of cloud system. So as part of converged infrastructure, having that common management paradigm and some of the demonstrations that were actually shown earlier um, through some of the keynotes is how HPUX and Integrity is a full member of HP cloud system. And so if customers want to deploy a full cloud-based environment, but the database engine for that cloud element is running on HPUX, which is a very typical usage model, that's all in, in integrated as part of our cloud system. So we see just tremendous opportunities there. Um, and um, a lot of the scale and resiliency features that you normally associate with Unix uh, and HPUX fit extremely well with the cloud paradigm. Martin, right, I wonder if you could talk about, um, doesn't really involve Intel, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, but, uh, but I w I'm interested in the, the whole culture of what's going on in HP, particularly within ESSN. I got the sense that it used to be, I'm not even sure if it was ESSN before, but it used to be a very fragmented organization. You know, the servers did its yeah. thing, and you really didn't have a you know, big networking business, and storage was kind of doing its thing. Um, it feels like it's really converged, you know, I know it's a, uh, a cliche, but yeah. it feels that way. Yeah. From an insider's perspective, what's, what's happening there? What's, what's transformed in the last two years? What's it like working for Donatelli? Yeah, is, he, uh, is he a crazy man? Is he, <laughs> you know? So actually, <laughs> the, 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 the fun part of this is I have to say, and, I have to, and I'll just give us a lot of credit, quite honestly, I'm just going to pat ourselves collectively on the back, because um, any internal fiefdoms that people might have perceived years ago, really none of them exist. Whether it's myself, Mark Potter, uh, David Scott uh, in storage as an example, and, and Bethany now in networking, um, we, we just completely work together. And there's, uh, we, we work together in terms of how do we leverage each other's capabilities and technologies. And so as Kirk was mentioning, it's everything from how do I use servers in storage? How do I bring the storage into servers? In my case, it was all about how I completely reused our blade system technology to turn that into the mission critical converged infrastructure. And now we're building appliances and converged systems using all of the networking technology and with our virtual connect networking technology embedding that in all of the infrastructure. So from our perspective, there are really no walls. I mean, you gotta, you know, you have to segment the business in some way and you have to put leaders at the head of those. Um, but I would be thrilled absolutely thrilled if any of my peers had to go out and you know sell a superdome even though that's my product i would be thrilled for any of them to go do that and i think the reverse would all be true so it's a tremendous group of people and the partnership and collaboration is through the roof so it's people which is it's, it's shared objectives incentives and and yeah. the like that have absolutely really changed. and and we we at intel have organized in a similar way if you would have gone back uh two years ago you would have dealt with three different divisions a storage group that was in the embedded side a server group and then a networking group that was actually right. tied to our vpro platform we've tied all that together so all the wired networking storage and our compute is in one organization so we very much mimic uh, the ESSN organization, which helps the two companies 
you know, and innovate together. And the bottom line is I actually think it's in a competitive advantage for us because at the end of the day, when you look at our product portfolio, whether it's mine or Mark's, or they actually all fit together. They're all part of one common infrastructure. <coughs> you go to my competitor like IBM, you want a mainframe, nothing in the mainframe looks anything like P-series, looks anything like X-series. Those, they don't mix, they don't match. You can't take pieces of one and put them into the other. In our case, an administrator who manages a two-socket DL380 can actually use all of the same tools and capabilities to manage a Superdome and a nonstop. That it really gives us a competitive that advantage. That common modular architecture that you guys have been pounding for a while, you're starting to now see the fruits of that labor. That's so right. uh, Martin Fink and Kirk Scougan, um of HP and Intel respectively, uh, talking about B BCS, the Itanium roadmap, the vision, um, Intel and HP's relationship, the 10 year anniversary of, of Itanium. Good luck with it. Um, you're fighting a, a great fight in the marketplace and uh, it's, it's wonderful to watch. Thanks for coming inside theCUBE and sharing all your knowledge with us. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. All right, this is